Donald Trump, since the start of this pandemic, has had quite interesting opinions about the coronavirus. I've heard his quotes as they've been said, but to see them all written in chronological order tells a lot more. I'll link to the timeline of the things he said, I hope it remains up forever because it's a fascinating read. I wanted to summarise it in this video, but if you read them in order, you'll understand why that's so difficult. It's a real jumble of mixed messages. For the most part, he plays down the pandemic, but then will sometimes blurt out how terrible it is. But which is it? He says how great America is doing, but looking at the case or death numbers at that time, they seem to say the opposite. And there are a lot of vague comments that don't provide any useful information at all. To give you the short and simple, back in March he said, just stay calm, it will go away, and the tests are beautiful. But he changed his tone halfway through the month, then saying, I felt it was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic, ending the month with, it's not the flu, it's vicious. So it sounds like that was the turning point when he started to take it seriously. In April he began offering possible solutions like injecting bleach, but then, curiously, he ended the month by saying it was going to go away again. The next few months were full of quotes where he was saying numbers were down and how it was going to go away, and he started talking about delivering a vaccine in record time. I would take all this as though he was confident it was under control. In August he talked about opening schools and how the FDA is slowing progress towards vaccines and treatments. Then in September it all moved to the election. He started repeating how close they were to a vaccine and how great a job America has done. His latest quote talked about how he doesn't wear a mask like Biden, who wears the biggest mask he's ever seen. And then on October the 2nd, Trump tested positive for coronavirus. And then he was taken by helicopter to hospital on Friday, just after the stock market closed. This was said to be a precautionary measure, even though the White House has its own medical team and equipment. That's just 48 hours after possibly displaying his first symptoms that he was taken to hospital, or less if he was just generally tired on Wednesday. The UK's Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, got coronavirus back in April. Both of these people are high risk, being both old and fat but the difference was the length of time between initial symptoms and when they went to hospital. For Boris, he had it for about 10 days before the virus took a turn for the worse, at which point he was rushed to hospital. Another difference between these two cases was how the general public reacted to it. With Boris, I felt it unified people in the UK. There was the general feeling that, even if you didn't like the guy or his policies, it was still bad for the country for him to be ill with it. But of course, in America, Trump going down with the coronavirus has simply served to polarise people further. Now onto the bit you've all been waiting for the UK. Since the outbreak there have been numerous news stories about members of parliament being naughty. During lockdown, we had Dominic Cummings breaking the rules by driving hundreds of miles, which he says he did to test his eyesight. Irish ministers who agreed on lockdown procedures then broke them to host a large private party at a golf club. And now, most recently, a member of the Scottish National Party showed symptoms, then took a train journey to London, where she was notified she had coronavirus, only to then travel all the way back by train as well just the latest in a long line of people who represent the best of the country and who really should know better. And them doing this kind of thing gives others an excuse to break the rules as well. I don't really follow the reasoning here, I feel like those who want to break the rules would have done so anyway, but there is definitely an element of, well, if they're doing it, why shouldn't we? It started a month or so ago, but cases in the UK are now rising quite rapidly. The latest weekly average is over 6,000 new cases a day and almost 50 deaths a day. The number of recorded cases is actually higher than the peak was earlier in the year, though this is down to how the testing is done. Earlier in the year, only hospitalised cases were counted, so the actual daily figure was likely closer to 100,000 cases a day. Right now, I doubt 6,000 is actually the number. It's probably higher, maybe two or three times greater than that, but still far lower than the number of people who were getting it earlier in the year. The difference is in how we test. The number of daily tests the UK does, and the speed at which the results come back, has significantly improved over time, to the point where we can map out where all of the infections are taking place, and to identify where the hotspots are. This allows the country to lock down individual cities and regions to contain the spread, whilst keeping the country as a whole open. It's not like the general lockdown earlier in the year just yet. I've got the NHS app on my phone, which is now being rolled out across the whole country. It relies on location and Bluetooth to identify who you've come into contact with, and if any of them test positive, you'll get a notification to quarantine or whatever. There are QR codes in venues that can be scanned. I've been following it as properly as I can since I'm very interested to see what sort of notifications I get so I can report back to you about it. So far it's been very boring and not a lot has happened. Obviously, for this to be effective, it relies on a certain percentage of the population to use it, to keep battery sapping phone features on, and to update it if they test positive. Unfortunately, I don't know anybody else who's using it. People I've asked have said that they don't trust it and don't believe it will ever be widely used enough to be effective. 
And with that kind of attitude, they're right. Still, I'm doing my part. While in America, coronavirus has been a polarising issue between political parties, in England it's more of a generational thing. Right now, the blame for the rise in cases is being pointed at younger people for breaking the rules and for hosting all sorts of illegal parties and stuff. And it's definitely the younger people who are getting infected the most. And many of these are through fresher parties and stuff, as seen in Northumbria University, where 770 students have all tested positive, coinciding quite nicely with the week that they all started university. And from anecdotal evidence, I see people dressed up and going past my window every night, who I assume are on their way to pubs and clubs. Which is odd, because they're supposed to close at 10, and these people are going past my window between 10 and 1 in the morning. So maybe they're going to house parties instead. Or perhaps the youth of today just likes walking around late at night in big groups for no apparent reason, I don't know. In young people's defence, I suspect it can't have helped matters that the government has chosen to reopen restaurants, shops, universities and schools, as these are all hotspots for infection, and typically places where younger people go to learn or to work. But I only have to talk to the older generations to know that the entire blame for the coronavirus is now sitting squarely on the 18-24 to 24 year old age group. Checking out the Daily Mail, their new source of preference, I was expecting it to be plastered with articles smearing the youth of today, but nestled somewhere down that mess of a front page I found just one article which was discussing the 770 students at Northumbria University. Which is fair enough. Here's the best rated comment section for those of you who are interested because I think it paints a fairly accurate picture of what older people think of the youth of today in general. I'm worried about the long-term implications of the virus. They extend well beyond the disease itself. Emergency procedures are still being done in hospitals, but early screenings and checkups have been postponed. I wonder how many cases of cancer and the like will be allowed to worsen or remain undetected thanks to the coronavirus. I was speaking to a doctor the other month and he said the increased use of alcohol-based hand washes could result in superbugs. I remember him saying that while the coronavirus is bad, at least they have ways of treating it. Superbugs? Not so much. I also know a vet, so can provide some insight into what their job is like. I can't say that the NHS staff have had a great time this year, but knowing a vet, they feel it's a profession that's been ignored. It's still a high-risk profession that needs to continue running. Yet unlike hospital staff, they've received no appreciation nor benefits to speak of. People take the service for granted, expect them to be open like a supermarket would, and some of the stories of abuse towards staff members I've heard have made me really angry. I wonder how many animals will remain unneutered or unvaccinated and how great the resulting workload of these decisions will be in the coming months and years. It's hard to comprehend the many ways the coronavirus has worsened or weakened other industries, and the years of consequences we'll have to face once all this is dealt with. Coronavirus will be the best documented pandemic the world has ever seen, but it's worth remembering what people saw a pandemic as before it started. I think we had all seen a movie about a pandemic. These typically over-exaggerate certain aspects like the mortality rate or the unrest it causes for a given number of cases, yet they often forget about other parts of it, like the panic buying of stupid stuff like toilet roll, or the groups of people adamant that it's all fake news, even when it's literally happening right down the street from them. But when it comes to actual pandemics, what do we think of? In terms of cases, swine flu in 2009 infected about a billion people but the fatalities were much lower, so I don't think they're that comparable. In fact, the most recent pandemic to really make the textbooks was Spanish flu, and that was over a hundred years ago. When something's that long ago, before the memories of living relatives, it stops being real. It becomes something you learn about at school, or read about in a textbook. And bits of it are forgotten. I think I imagined it as being a terrible thing that ravaged the whole world for over a year, killing millions, keeping everybody in perpetual fear and terror the whole time. But it couldn't have been like that. It would have been a period where life had to keep its head down as it tried to carry on. As bad as things were, businesses had to remain open and day-to-day -day life had to keep moving. That's a part of a pandemic that experiencing the coronavirus firsthand has really made me aware of. Yes, it's terrible and yes, it does affect everything, but you can't just stop everything else until it's gone. You have to somehow strike a balance between it and what you'd be doing normally. As you're going about your daily life, you're continually weighing up the risk versus reward of everything you do. For the most part, you abide by the rules and they don't limit you that much. But there are times when you run into those rules, and that's when you really see how far you're willing to stretch them. And I'm not saying the average person bends them as much as those in power seem to. I think for you to understand what I'm talking about, I need to give a few personal examples. My housemate invites work colleagues around to the house. These are all high-risk people working in an environment that's exposed to the general public. People come around when they shouldn't have. 
But when they're literally working together in the same building five days a week, what difference does it make? That's one example where technically the rules have been bent, but it's hard to argue with it because it makes no sense why you're allowed to work with somebody but aren't allowed to see them outside of work. If anything, it's less risky than what they're doing every day of their working lives anyway. Another thing, and I think something that will be overlooked on social media because we're all generally younger people, is the impact that it has had on the elderly. I have an 85-year-old granddad who's had to live through this. From his point of view, he spent the best part of this year locked away inside his home, avoiding the world. On paper it makes sense for him to do so, since at his age there's something like a 1 in 7 chance that it will kill him. But he said this to me, he doesn't know how long he's got left, does he really want to spend it stuck away? Is that really an existence worth living? What a sad, lonely time to be alive. As a younger person, I have technology and friends online, and not so much fear from the disease when going about my daily life. It's disrupted my life, but I've still got an existence of sorts. In fact, probably a more sociable one than before. But he's had virtually every form of human interaction and routine taken away from him. And for so many reasons, even without the pandemic, it's been a horrible year. Even something as simple as browsing the supermarket would be the highlight of his month and he's not even allowed to do that. My parents have been brilliant, they've checked in on him, they've got supplies and have gone with him to places far away from civilization for walks and days out. They've been allowed to meet him thanks to the support bubble system the government introduced, because how else are those who are alone and at risk supposed to survive otherwise? But this has had the knock-on effect of me having to avoid my parents, in fear of infecting them which would cut off the one lifeline my granddad has. You've got these sorts of things to consider whenever you see friends or family. It complicates every form of interaction that we've taken for granted up until now. One thing he had to look forward to was a holiday that he planned at the start of the year. And the other week, it went ahead as planned and without a hitch. He and my parents stayed in one caravan, I stayed in another and travelled in a separate car. But we go on the same walks every day. But there was always the idea that you needed to keep your distance, to not talk directly at them and to sit at least two metres away when having a picnic. Inevitably, as the week went on, compromises started being made. It ends up happening, no matter how safe you think you're being. After four or five days, rightly or wrongly, you feel like you've all been quarantined away for long enough to feel like you're separate from the rest of the world again. I guess it's situations like those that separate reading about a pandemic in a textbook to actually being six months into one for real. At times he'd walk right past me, or I'd open a pack of his favourite biscuits and offer it to him first. Every day I'd wake up, worried that I'd have developed symptoms, and if I had, what would I do then? Are they actual symptoms, or is it just the cold air? And if I did get it, where would it have come from? My only line of contact with the outside world are the occasional shop visits and my housemates. But what if they have it and don't show symptoms? What if I didn't wash my hands thoroughly enough after the last time I picked something up in the kitchen? Like I said, this sort of worry permeates everything, but during that holiday, there were times where things almost felt normal. That reassurance that life could carry on, even when compromises had to be made, and even during a terrible pandemic, new good memories could still be made and relationships maintained. I'm back from holiday now, everything went as well as it could have done, and I feel it was a much needed break for him as much as anyone. To know that there is still reason to live and things to look forward to, we were in the middle of nowhere, but I remember at one point when walking through the forest, an elderly couple came the other way. They were going to avoid us by a good 5 metres, but they made an active effort to get further away still so they were more like 15 metres away from us, and they put on masks. I don't know their situation, maybe they're particularly at risk, or maybe they're from a sheltered community that's absolutely scared stiff of outsiders. But it was one of several encounters we had that reminded us that, even when you're in the middle of nowhere, an invisible threat still has control. It's the Illuminati. I'm really proud of that. Bit of an update, I was about to release this video and I got this notification on my phone telling me that I'd been near somebody who had tested positive. I clicked on it and it just went back to the main page. Seems there's a bit of a problem with the app where it reports false positives. Doesn't seem to be anywhere in the software for you to be able to see every instance of contact you've had with others, though it sometimes pops up with a list when I least expect it. It's not the best program just yet. And I also remembered a dank interview on Radio 1 with Scottish leader Nicola Sturgeon. Here's the best bit. Just on students wanting to do the right thing, are they allowed to have one night stands? Look, you're, they're not supposed to be in other people's households right now. I'm, 
you know, there are limits here to what I'm going to sit and say to students about the, the regulation of their intimate private lives. I'm asking people to use their common sense. If you're with somebody but you don't cohabit, that's an exception to the, how, the no household mixing rule. So if students are in that position where you've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that's an, an exception. But sometimes it's not as clear cut. What about friends with benefits? Oh, come on. 